I'm just changing my name. So hopefully now you can see here, I'm gonna even make it shorter um, so that you can see my name uh, a little bit easier um, and it'll be a little bit clearer who I am. Um, so I wanna let you know in my little name block right now is my unique name. Um, I heartily encourage you, um, we are going to, there we go. Uh, we are going to uh, show our, um, our email address for our kind of general office. I would highly recommend you use that over my unique name and email address because I do things other than Fulbright. Uh, but nevertheless, if you felt like you needed to get directly in contact with me, um, that's my unique name. So without any further ado, let's begin. Uh, I wanted to let you know that I've been very generously invited over here by Kelly to be talking about English teaching, uh, but that Fulbright actually has a lot of other different components. So you're gonna see through these slides that there are multiple other things that you can do through Fulbright, but we're going to make sure that we spend a predominant amount of time talking about English teacher, uh, the English teacher assistant program. I did also want to note uh, I think that Kelly just mentioned this, but I'll say it again. Uh, Kelly has actually been an ETA before. So in certain parts of the presentation, we may stop for a hot minute and ask Kelly about her personal experiences um, because they're likely to be very valuable for you to get a better understanding about the program. So let's begin. I'm actually really excited because this will be the first time we're talking about Fulbright for this next upcoming cycle. You are all uh, privileged to see exactly what we know right now about what's gonna be happening uh, for the next year. So first things first, let's just talk about the elephant in the room. I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a bit of a plague going on. Uh, the good news about that is that that does not stop this application from running. That does not stop Fulbright from happening. Uh, it doesn't stop the government from moving on, which means this is still something that you should be considering right now. If you've ever thought about being a Fulbrighter beforehand, there's no reason to stop believing it now. So. Fulbright in the time of COVID-19, every question you might have regarding, hey, is it going to be running uh, when, in 2022? Is this all going to be something worth my time? Or what countries are going to be available? Your guess at this point is as good as ours. Why? Because any travel for the next upcoming Fulbright cycle is 12 to 18 months away. A lot can happen 12 to 18 months from now. Um, we're hoping that there's going to be a vaccine. We're going to hope that a lot of people have a different plan about how to monitor yourself or take care of yourself during this time. Uh, so there's no reason not to think that things are going to be okay enough to travel, and that's going to help propel you forward as you're applying for these applications through these applications. Um, we did also want to let you know and remind you because people are in lockdowns, that means that they're kind of easier to locate. Everyone's checking their email. Everyone is uh, able to Zoom. They've, they've kind of caught up now with how things work technologically. So as you're looking for advisors like me or references uh, or affiliations or people who might be able to talk to you about what country you'd want to go to, you can do all of this virtually and they're probably easier to contact now virtually because they've had a little bit of experience using Zoom. And then also, Maybe you're sitting at home thinking, my God, I don't get to go out and have any Christmas parties or do a Friendsgiving. Well, lucky for you, that means that opens up a lot of time for writing essays and applying for different stuff. Um, so this, uh, it's, you know, it's not an easy time to live through, but there are some silver linings that you can capitalize on. Just a reminder. So what do you do when you are applying for a Fulbright through the University of Michigan. The first stop is your uh, Fulbright website through the International Institute UMich site. So this is where, where, where we're located. You're gonna wanna join our mailing list so that we keep you updated on any changes to the application, info sessions, interview times, things like that. And you're also going to want to check out our UM Fulbright resources site. Now it may not be 100% up to date just yet because the old application just closed. This is a little early in the process. Nevertheless, these are still the two places that you should be checking out for kind of your one-stop shop on what is the University of Michigan currently doing about Fulbright. Uh, again, you're visiting the resource page. It's important to note that this is for UM users only. 
So you can actually be an alumni of the University of Michigan. If you're a senior right now and you're gonna graduate, you could be an alum and still apply for Fulbright, but you will have to use a unique name to get onto this. You'll have to use your UM uh, website privileges in order to go and see this page. Um, please know, of course, after you graduate, you are still welcome to come and talk to us as advisors. You're also able to get an interview, even though you're not a student on campus. So just letting you guys know, if you are in any way moderately affiliated with the University of Michigan, we are here for you to be able to help you uh, consider your Fulbright desires. Before you start an application, you're going to see this page on our uh, Fulbright resources site. And it's going to tell you again, it's going to remind you again to sign up for our listserv, sign up for any updates and things like that. And it may answer some preliminary eligibility questions, such as, for example, do you happen to be a U.S. citizen? Those are the questions that you're going to want to make sure that you check out before you start an application, because heaven forbid you start an application and then find out you're not actually eligible for these programs. Just let me know. What is the Fulbright program? Where did it all come from? Well, a long time ago in 1946, uh, there was a senator, Senator Fulbright. He had this brilliant idea. Hey, why don't we invest money in a program that actually is, has a really great diplomatic mission that ameliorates these relationships between the United States and countries abroad? Um, so it's really important to note that Cutting through all of this, Fulbright is a really great program, but it's number one mission, advertising. You are essentially assuming the role of Mickey Mouse. Hi, I'm a United States citizen. I'm smart, I'm capable, I'm thoughtful, and I want to learn about your country and your world. And I'm here to tell you more about what it means to be a U.S. citizen. And through this, the United States government is able to achieve a few things. One, good promotion and good uh, visibility across the globe. This kind of shows us, hey, we're investing in communities around the world and that we care and that we want to learn more about other people. And that way, effectively for other governments, we are also showing them, hey, work with us. We're going to be able to make good connections along the way. It's mutually beneficial for you and the people you come into contact with, because essentially as an English teacher, you will be teaching them English always a plus, and you will be learning about their country, putting this on your resume, and people will think, wow, my gosh, you're an English teacher, that's fantastic. So everybody wins from all of this, but it's important to note that this was all started to increase mutual understanding between people from the United States and people of other countries. You're gonna wanna lodge that little piece of information in the back of your head, because when it comes to application writings, that's something people will look for. It's not just, hey, Fulbright's gonna be great for me, or I'm gonna be great for other people I see, but also I will be spreading mutual understanding while I'm in another country. And that's kind of, in some cases, the ticket to getting a Fulbright. Moving on. So what are your eligibility basics? First off, to apply through the University of Michigan, you must be a University of Michigan student or an alumni. So enrolled students will automatically have to apply through the University of Michigan. You don't get an out. If you are not a student, you can apply just as a US citizen. You don't have to state that you're in any way associated with the University of Michigan. I'm gonna be honest with you though, there's a few perks. First of all, you get to talk to people like me who know a little bit about this program. Second, you get an interview that's gonna prepare you if you decide that you wanna apply for this program. And third, I don't know if you know this, but the University of Michigan is actually one of the top Fulbright producing institutions in the nation. So we have great street cred. So if you want to come and be a part of the Fulbright program, there's nothing wrong with showcasing that you are a UM alum, just saying. Anyway, but that's up to your choice if you are not associated with the University of Michigan. You must be a US citizen. Permanent residents are not eligible. Sorry, I can't change that. And if you have other things that you'd like to do, please come talk to us because we can help you if you are not a US citizen, find some other fellowship opportunities. But for this particular program, that'd be a US citizen. You must have a bachelor's degree by the start of the grant. Oh, and I have a wrong date on here. I have a couple wrong dates, my apologies. So you must have a bachelor's degree by the time, by 2022 summer. That's important. 
Um, the reason being, yeah, by 2022, late summer. Uh, the reason being is that officially means that you are graduated and you can begin these programs. You have your bachelor's degree in hand. You also, and again, I apologize for the dates. This is one year behind. You can't have completed a PhD at the time of application, which, which would actually be the fall of 2021. So if you are working on a PhD right now and you didn't apply for Fulbright this last cycle, sorry, this is not where you would go for a Fulbright opportunity, but be advised, you can also get a Fulbright uh, through the scholars program. There's a Fulbright scholars program outside of this. So again, come and talk to me if you were going to have a PhD. You also need to have necessary language skills. Now the good news about being a Fulbrighter uh, who is doing an English teaching assistance program, most of the time you're not required to have any language skills to be able to do this program. Um, you can just kind of walk in and your whole job is just teaching English anyway. However, there may be some places that are encouraged by you having language skills and abilities. So let's say, for example, you, uh, you wanted to go teach English in Indonesia and you happen to have uh, some ability to speak Indonesian, that's not a bad thing at all, it's a plus. It means you're gonna be able to interact with the community a little bit better, um, but it's also not required. The other thing to remember throughout all of this is because you know we're looking at English teaching, but if you're like, oh, I'm particularly interested in you know doing research, doing a study program, the important thing is, is you have to land on one country and one type of grant in each individual application cycle. You can't do both. You can get a Fulbright in an English teaching assistantship one year, and then in a future year, apply for a research grant. They don't discredit you or disqualify you if you've received it one year from applying again. So that's another part. If you're thinking about, oh, maybe I don't wanna apply right now because I don't wanna hurt my chances in the future, not a problem. You can, over the course of your uh, career, get multiple uh, Fulbrights at different times. Moving on. Why would you want to do this in the first place? Gosh, this looks like an awful lot of work. What's the benefits to this? Well, the good news is, if we're flying, round trip airfare. That's pretty nice. You're going to get a stipend to cover your living expenses. You'll get accident and sickness coverage. Now, that's not a, a, a large amount of coverage. So sometimes if you have a specific health needs, that's something you're going to want to double check. But essentially, oh, pretty decent coverage. You might also get opportunities to have book and research allowances. Um, there are going to be enrichment activities. Sometimes there's tuition reimbursement, depending. Um, there are going to be language study programs you can be on. And then also you'll get an opportunity to be introduced to this country through uh, orientations. Lots of fun stuff comes through this, not to mention, I think it's really important to note, that this is a big value add for anybody's resume. It looks really nice. People are impressed by Fulbrights. Worth noting. Uh, by the way, I did want to note uh, Kelly, because I know you're out there in the ether, if you are seeing any uh, questions that come up that are worth stopping the conversation, please just let me know. I don't think I have as much visibility to questions that are out there. Just want to throw that in. Okay, so let's focus. What can I do and where can I go with a Fulbright? And as you can see, I've kind of grayed out some of the other opportunities. I want them to be up there just in case you were wondering, hey, what does a study in research or creative performing arts uh, opportunity look like. They're there, but obviously we're focusing on the e uh, English teaching assistantship. So what's the whole point? Well, you're gonna assist teaching English and American culture in primary, secondary, or university classrooms part-time. Um, and sometimes you're going to have a small scale independent project. So essentially you're not even a full-fledged teacher you're sitting alongside English teachers and basically providing a visual life, uh, life important, I'm sorry, in-person example, there we go, in-person example. Hi, I'm a United States citizen. This is what I look like. This is one example of what it means to be a US citizen. And this is the language that I speak and this is the accent that I have. These things are incredibly valuable from primary school all the way up to universities. It's really good to kind of put a face to the United States. This means that you're going to be there for normally their school year, which can be anywhere from nine to 12 months, depending on where you're going. And it's an assigned placement. So you'll be applying to the country, 
you may even give an indication of where in the country you might like to go. For example, if you were applying to Spain, uh, you know, uh, Andalusia is going to be very different from Catalonia. So I, it's, it's, there's clearly a variety, but essentially the country will get to decide where it is that you are teaching English. And it is important to note, you're probably not going to a big city. You're not gonna be hanging out in Barcelona per se. You're probably going to be somewhere out in the hillside where it's less likely that a student will see you uh, and see American citizens and where it really gives them value to actually talk to somebody um, who speaks English and is a US citizen that they never would have met otherwise. Um, this is one of the fastest growing areas of Fulbright. So it actually began as a research fellowship and then exploded as an English teaching assistantship opportunity because it's a really great way to spread diplomacy. Right now, there are over 70 countries that accept uh, Fulbrighters to come in and help with English and over 900 awards. That's actually quite a lot. Um, and again, it's growing. So it's important to note that even if you're looking at this, you're like, I don't know, that seems like kind of a few, no, 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 it's quite a lot. And you have a really great opportunity to go. I would highly encourage you to consider it if this is something that you really wanna do um, with your time following graduation. And now I'm gonna be quiet. I'm gonna step back and see if Kelly has an opportunity to talk a little bit about her experiences uh, when she went as an English teacher. Thanks, Melissa. Um, so as Melissa mentioned, um, in between undergrad and graduate school, um, I participated in the Fulbright English Teaching Assistantship Program in Germany. Um, as an undergraduate, I was a, a German and a psychology major, and I actually did study abroad in Germany for one year as an undergraduate, but I felt um, that I, I spoke far too much English and hung out only with other American study abroad students while I was there. So even though I was in Germany for a full year, I felt like my German really didn't make as much progress as I had hoped for. So that was one of the reasons why I decided to apply for the Fulbright after undergraduate for another opportunity to really immerse myself in the culture. And I will say that um, the Fulbright experience was far more immersive than my personal study abroad experience. I was placed in a a smaller town. Um, I think the whole the metro area was around 70,000. It was a town called Allen um, in Baden-Württemberg in Germany. And um, there were, you know, some other Americans in the town, but it, it was very different than a study abroad experience because I was working. Um, the majority of the people that I spent time with were Germans or other international folks who were her living in the community. So I felt like my knowledge of the German culture and language absolutely you know, accelerated as a result of this experience. I wanted to underscore a couple of things. So um, Melissa mentioned that the, the English teaching assistantship, um, it, it, you, you really are an assistant teacher. So you're, you're not necessarily going to be teaching 40 hours a week. And um, that, that's important to note because um, you will almost certainly have time to pursue, you know, side projects, um, as the slide mentioned here, design, design a small scale independent, independent project. So this is nice because maybe you're, you're really interested in teaching English, but then you have a passion for theater or for sports or something else. Um, you're able to really cultivate that and get involved with the community in another way. And that's something that's really encouraged. And um, as, as part of the Fulbright application, you actually have to write about it. Um, so it's a really nice way to be able to explore other interests while participating in the teaching program. The other thing I think is really cool about the program is that every, um, every country's English teaching assistantship has you know, a slightly different description. So when you're reading through the website, um, you'll see that sometimes uh, you know, you're, you'd be working with like primary school students or sometimes you're with university students or sometimes they get even more specific. I can't remember the country, but I remember um, one, one of the, the English teaching assistantship country descriptions actually mentioned that they're looking for an ETA who has experience with Model UN because they're hoping to implement Model UN in, in their school. Um, so that's very specific, but um, that's an example of how there, there really is a program out there for everyone. And sometimes there's a program that's really tailored to maybe an interest that you have. So it's worth really looking at um, as many of the descriptions as possible because you might find something that really fits in well with you. I also wanted to just highlight, um, Melissa mentioned the interview process. And um, I was interviewed you know, as part of my Fulbright process, but um, as a Fulbright alum, I've been involved with Fulbright interviews here at Michigan for several years. And 
Um, I think they're just, it, it's such a huge benefit um, to students who are applying for the Fulbright to go through the Michigan interview process. You know, it's called an interview and yes, the interviewers do ask you questions, but really it's all about helping you prepare the best application possible. So the questions are really about like helping you clarify what are your goals with doing this program? And, and also, you know, reading through your materials and asking you, you know, maybe what you meant by something um, so that you can clarify it before you actually submit the application. So um, that's a really great resource and would 100% um, recommend taking advantage of it, even if maybe you're an alum um, when you do apply. And then one other thing I wanted to mention quickly, because this kind of applied to me when I was considering Fulbright. Um, you know, Fulbright is pretty competitive, especially depending on, you know, whatever country you're looking into. And for me, I knew I wanted to do graduate school too. So I wasn't sure how to balance that. So I ended up applying for the Fulbright and graduate school um, at the same time. Um, graduate school for me was the, the School of Social Work at the, the University of Michigan. And um, I ended up getting both. And so um, I was able to uh, contact my, my graduate program and ask them if it was possible to defer for one year because I received the Fulbright. And um, I think probably because the Fulbright does have some name recognition and it is known to be a great opportunity, I was able to do that. So I did not need to reapply for the School of Social Work um, while I was abroad, of course. Um, whether or not that's possible will be very dependent on you know whatever graduate program you're looking into so no promises there um, but it is it's a, it's something to look into and it has potential so i just thought i would mention that i think i'll turn the floor back over to melissa uh, i don't want to take up too much time but happy to answer any other questions as we go through and those are incredibly salient points and and not to go on to a tangent but if this sort of stuff seems to appeal to you i want to let you know that fulbright in general is kind of, um, forgive the term, a gateway drug into some other really fantastic scholarships and fellowships. Uh, so if you're, if you feel like you're, you're getting on uh, the feel of this, you start to do the application. You're like, I could, I could do this. I could crank out a bunch of essays. I could find references. Um, then I highly encourage that you continue to reach out to our office uh, because this is just, mm, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There are plenty of other things that you can be applying for for the rest of your academic career that keep getting you funding and sending you abroad to do the things you want to do. So I'm just going to let you, I'm going to mind ninja you that. I'm going to have it sit in the back of your brain while we finish this up. So to continue, very good points. Let's talk about the application components. So as uh, Kelly was mentioning, there are certain things that are going to be within this application, um, such as a potential independent study project that are a big part of your application. I also want to point out again, you can see on one side of the screen, we kind of uh, 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 shadowed out the other things that you would have to do in order to do a study and research uh, program. So I want them to be there just in case you're interested in seeing, but Let's focus on English teaching. So you have an online application. You'll have to go through the IIE website. So I'm the International Institute at the University of Michigan. The application is going to be on the International Institute of Education, which is a contracting organization that is funded through the State Department for this particular program. And that's where the application lies. So you fill out the application. There's some general questions, obviously. They're gonna have some short answer questions as well. And then you're also going to be filling out two statements. You have a statement of purpose and a personal statement. Your statement of purpose would basically be where does ETA fit into your overall career focus? How is this going to kind of play out for you in your career and your work? Why is this of value to you? And then your personal statement is a lot more about why you want to travel, why this country, uh, what what emotionally do you have to gain from this that kind of thing? And it's a you can balance uh, your reasons for why you're applying throughout these two essays. There's no necessarily set recipe, but what you will want to cover is why this country, in both personally and professionally, what your career trajectory is. Are you planning on being a, as English as a second language teacher? Are you planning on working in this country? Are you planning on taking this opportunity to improve your knowledge of this country and then going off to do research? This would be where you would kind of digest that. It's important to note that two pages is pretty darn short. Um, and it can feel daunting at first to try and come up with all these reasons, but 
if you really dig deep and try and think, why is this of value to you? You're probably gonna have a lot longer than two pages. Now is the perfect time. You have so much time before this application is due to just sit down and marinate. Why is it that I wanna do this program? What are all the possible things that this could mean for me as far as my career? Start jotting them down so you can get a whole lot of them out there and then kind of whittle away from that to get to your the heart of your reasoning for applying to this program. In essence, these two pages. That would be my recommendation at this point. You're also gonna need three recommendations. And here's how I would, uh, in a very short burst, what are the best types of recommendations? People who know you well, first and foremost, you want them to have a very genuine perspective on who it is that you are and why this is a great opportunity for you. And then after that, you want people to be leaders in their field, specifically in the work that you are doing or the things that you are interested in. Um, you want them to be kind of leaders in that area, people that you have worked with, mentors, people whose uh, perspectives you believe in. And then finally, if at all possible, the top of their field and group. So if you're trying to weigh the difference between, okay, a professor versus the head, the professor who's the head of the department, the head of the department's going to look a lot cooler because this is, in essence, a bit diplomatic. And it is a little bit hierarchical. It's a big deal. So big deal people get big deal recognition. It's just the truth of the matter. But first and foremost, like I said, if they know you, you want people to know you and be able to speak to you well. You will also have transcripts. It's important to note that unlike some other fellowships that are like 4.0 only, this is not that way. Uh, in fact, because uh, the Fulbright program is looking to kind of diversify, they may be willing to kind of overlook GPA a little bit more to look for more unique people with unique uh, perspectives on different ways the future can go. So if you have a really uh, deep-seated interest in something different, maybe not the the, the, the most illustrious grades in the entire world, you should still be applying for this program. And it's not just for people who are at the top of their undergraduate game. Uh, and then finally, you may need a foreign language evaluation. Depending on where you're going, depending on the country profile, they may want you to have at least some experience with a language. And if that happens, then they're going to ask you to be evaluated by a foreign language evaluator, which guess what? At the University of Michigan, we have tons of people who teach languages. Those would be your language evaluators. I did also want to take uh, a moment and reflect on something else that Kelly brought up, which is that each single country has very different specifications for what they're looking for in applicants. So if you have decided of, of all the places in the world you want to go, Uzbekistan, that's the place. I highly recommend that after this conversation, you go and specifically It's important to go and check what specifications that country is looking for. And that's how you can start to tailor make your application to, uh, to this particular program. I'm going to take a quick pause. I'm just going to wait. Kelly, did you want to add anything? If we're golden, we're golden. I'll just... I think we're good for now. You can continue. Perfect. Okay. And I'm going to move forward. All right, now this one I know I did connect correct all the dates, so this should look correct for us. Um, this is the general application timeline. You should know we're way, way ahead of everything. We're talking about we're right here in November. Um, we're not even preparing to do a bunch of bulk info sessions anywhere close to anything but January. So uh, January is actually when you would be coming in at the very beginning, having an idea of like, hey, I think I want to apply for this program. How do I start? So we're way in advance. Um, and then the whole kind of application preparation period is going to be from January 2021 all the way through August. You'll see opportunities on our website to talk about, uh, to have info sessions, talk with advisors, do drafts of your program, send drafts to us for review. Yeah, that's all in the future. It's all coming up. And then the UM application deadline is often in late August. And it's dependent upon the Fulbright national deadline, which has not been set yet because the last application literally just closed in October. 
So if you're like, well, I don't see the date yet, uh, that's because it hasn't happened yet. They haven't even decided. So you're gonna have a UM application deadline. It's important to note that if you miss this deadline, that does not mean that you cannot apply for the Fulbright program. All it means is that we cannot guarantee you any further assistance with your application, nor can we give you an interview. You must have your application submitted through the IIE website by our UM application deadline for an interview. What will happen is, is that when we have this interview, as you can see, between September and October, we will review your things. Again, we do not whittle away any people at this time. It's not our job to tell Fulbright who shouldn't be a Fulbrighter. It's our job to basically have an informational interview with you about your application, show you where it can be improved, then give it back to you. We unsubmit your application back to you for you to edit and resubmit by the Fulbright national deadline. I know this is kind of getting a little bit confusing, but it's important to know this is future stuff. Uh, so right now we should just be thinking, hey, where would, it, where would it be that I would want to go? Nevertheless, the Fulbright national deadline will be in October of 2021. After that, the Fulbright program, it's out of UM's hands, the Fulbright program will go through initial notifications and screening. They go through everybody's application and they kind of pass their own judgment between November and December of 2021. They will then make their preliminary decisions. We'll know who's kind of going to be the semi-finalists around January. Most people who apply for a Fulbright are not going to get an interview by Fulbright themselves. If they do, it's normally for a study or research program, not for an English teacher program. So it's important to know talking with us as the campus committee, that's the one in semi-interview you're going to have and that your application is really going to speak for you. That's it, that's your chance. The final notifications will happen in March and May of 2022. So if you are going to be graduating in spring of 2022 and you submit your application next fall, then by the time you graduate, you will know whether or not you've been accepted into Fulbright. That's the, that's the aspiration. Of course, with the tiny asterisks in there of who knows what's gonna happen with COVID-19, but let's not think about that right now. That's pretty far off in the future. I just wanna let you know that that would be the only thing that kind of throws a, a wrench into the gears. I'm gonna take another minute and go a little bit deeper into the UM process. So again, you submit your application through the online application through the International Institute of Education and the deadline for the University of Michigan will be through August. We can see everything that you submit for IIE. So anytime you submit it, we'll know that you're there. Based on your submission in August, we will set up an interview with you. Every person who puts in an application gets an interview. You will be in front of faculty members, former Fulbrighters. You'll be in front of uh, staff members like myself who will sit down and basically look through your application and say, so what did you mean by this? Tell me about your experiences here. What were you trying to say? Very, very rarely would we ever come across an application in which we would then talk to Fulbright and say, we don't recommend this person for Fulbright. That never happens. 90% of everything that comes through our uh, interview process, we will recommend you to go forward and do your Fulbright. What you're looking for though, is the difference between a, yep, this person could go on a Fulbright and they would have no problems versus a, oh my gosh, why haven't you accepted this person for a Fulbright yet? So I encourage you to still take these interviews seriously, but know that it is very likely we're just gonna pass you forward. So we can talk more about that on another day. Um, after, this, after you have your interview, your application is submitted back to you for any edits you'd like to make. They can make your final edits based on what you think would be a good way to put your best foot forward. And then you resubmit your application back to IIE prior to the final deadline. Um, we encourage you to submit it earlier rather than later because who wants to deal with the technical glitch at five minutes to midnight uh, They're on the due date? And then finally, your deadline will come up. You have to have everything submitted by the national deadline, no exceptions. So, 
that's pretty much the whole spiel. I did want to let you guys know that while they have not yet been set up, these are the types of info sessions that are going to be coming down the pike in spring and summer of next year, which is, hey, maybe you really like the idea of being an English teacher, but now you're kind of thinking, what about studying research? Or I play the violin. I wonder if that's something I can do. So we have some sessions to help you sort out which one is going to be the best award for you at this time. Um, I also uh, would recommend if you are sitting there thinking about what about how I get a reference or affiliates? I've never done this before. What if I'm trying to talk to somebody in another country we've never met and I'm just graduating, who am I? Um, I highly recommend the reference and affiliates, cold calls and informational interviews uh, conversation. And then if you are particularly interested in a research project but you've never written a research proposal before, um, we also have an info session where you can talk with our colleague, Dr. Takata, uh, who regularly instructs people on how to write a research project and was a recipient of that herself. So she can give better details on how to write a really fully fledged uh, research proposal. Additionally, uh, if you go to the International Institute of Education website, they do all their own webinars too. So they'll have stuff out there for, hey, have you been thinking about being a Fulbrighter? Just because this is available to anybody who lives in the United States who has a bachelor's degree. Um, so if I wasn't enough for you, I get it. You can go and talk to the people at the International Institute of Education. Again, these, web, uh, these webinars are likely to become available after January of next year because they're still wrapping up last year's application. Once again, this is the team of people who will talk to you about Fulbrights uh, starting next year. Uh, Heather Johnson, the person in the center is my colleague. She's been doing this for years now. Nobody knows Fulbright like Heather knows Fulbright. You can also see me, I'm there, I'm one of the advisors. Dr. Takata is specifically does a lot of research opportunities or study work. And then the two arrows are pointing at Dan Cameron and Rachel Wright. They are advisors who regularly talk to uh, English teachers or uh, English teacher assistant hopefuls. Uh, so those would be the people you're more likely to talk to for an ETA. Last but not least, this is normally where we reside, which is in Weiser Hall. I don't know if you guys remember that, but uh, that's where we're out at. Um, and this is our email address our location for advising, if you have any questions about uh, getting an advising appointment, our website and our resources site. And I think that's it. And so thank you so much for being a part of this program. I'm more than happy to answer any questions you have. I'm actually just gonna go one step back because this has most of the critical information. And, uh, and yeah, I'd open the floor if anybody has any specific question. Thanks so much, Melissa. That was really helpful. Um, yeah, so for uh, folks that are, are still in the room, um, you can go ahead and put your questions in the chat if you'd prefer, or um, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, I was wondering, so I noticed that um, the um, time period was about nine to 12 months. I was wondering, what if you would like to stay like two or three years or if this is something that you would like to do more than one year, um, would you like apply for another grant in the same position um, or apply again or kind of how does that work? So it's important to note that this is, a, it, this is kind of like meant to be a tasting menu. This is a diplomatic endeavor in which you are sharing a little bit of yourself and they're sharing a little bit of themselves. Um, the English teaching program is kind of meant to be like, look, you speak English, you've been in an English speaking location uh, for your young adult life, and you have all the colloquialisms, the understanding of what's going on in the United States right now. That's why it's not an extensive program. You're kind of that colloquial connection. Um, now, if you're particularly interested in staying for longer periods of time, Kelly might actually be best served to help you because there may be other programs better suited to that interest. Kelly, did you have any, a, a good example actually, before I'm gonna cut off Kelly before I even give her the floor. Um, but a good example of that is uh, I was not an ETA, but I was on the JET program. The JET program is the Japan English teaching program. That has a capacity of going for up to five years, but even then it's one of those like after three, they're hoping you move on to something else because you likely lost a lot of the colloquialisms that you came in with in your first year. Anyway, I'll step back and let Kelly answer that question probably a little more fully. 
Well, I don't know if I have a ton to share um, right now, but um, as Melissa said, it is true that that some of the other sort of teaching abroad programs um, that we've mentioned over the course of these individual program specific sessions, and then also in the main teaching abroad session that we did back on October 29th. Um, some of them do offer flexibility to renew, but it, it's it's definitely not, you know, it's not guaranteed, I don't think, in all cases. Um, I think you would have to apply for it, uh, even with JET, it sounds like. Um, so it's something we could certainly talk about a little bit more, maybe on an individual basis, but it just depends on the program. Okay, okay. So Fulbright is kind of like um, a stepping stone for some more um, opportunities so that you kind of get the experience um, and then move forward um, having that experience under your belt. Exactly. And it's, I, I thank you so much for saying stepping stone and not gap year, because the irony is, is yeah, it really kind of could be considered a gap year. You're doing something in between something else. That's kind of what a gap year is supposed to mean. However, heaven forbid you write that in your application. Like, I can't wait to do a gap year of being a Fulbrighter. I, nobody's going to appreciate that. But it, essentially, yes, it's a stepping stone. This is, I'm introducing myself. They're introducing themselves to me. And this is because I want to do research in this place in the future. It's because I'm interested in education. It's because I want to be a second uh, uh, and English as a second language teacher. So there's plenty of reasons for why it's a good stepping stone to another opportunity. But yeah, unfortunately, it's not really a means in itself. It's not a long-term career of Fulbright. Mm -hmm. One thing I, I did actually want to add, um, based on you know my, my own experience in Germany, I did have a couple of friends who ended up um, Basically, I, I don't, they didn't necessarily stay in Germany right after the grant ended, but during that year of Fulbright, they made connections, either personal or professional or other types of connections um, that ended up with them actually moving back to Germany right away and in some cases still being there now several years later. So some folks maybe decided to go back to Germany for graduate school. Other folks maybe met their, you know, life partner while they were while they were doing the Fulbright. Um, so uh, for a variety of reasons, I mean, the connections that you make during the year could potentially, you know, turn into something long term. Well, I, oh, sorry, I just had one last question that was about the recommendations. I was just wondering if they all had to be like English related, um, like professors or um, individuals, or if they could maybe even be like a foreign language professor? Oh, sure. No, this it's absolutely. So it's, um, you, you I, I sure, I'm sure at this point, you're kind of well aware of, look, you want a little bit of a variety, a little bit of a take, again, for people to be getting all the sense of who you are. So let's just say, for example, um, you want to be an English teacher, but one of your projects might be a environmental betterment. You want to encourage everyone uh, to uh, uh, reduce their usage of uh, plastic bags. Um, so you might have, okay, you have somebody who is an English, uh, who is an English uh, professor who thinks you speak English very well. You might have a language teacher who can say, you know, um, uh, Nia is very good at picking up uh, language skills. Uh, she's able to communicate very well. And then you might have somebody from the environmental department saying like, you know, I really appreciate her passion for the reduction of plastic bags. What a brilliant idea. And so that way it kind of speaks to all these different areas that you will talk about in your application with a thumbs up. Yep, I agree. She's the person who can do all these things. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you so much. No problem. Uh, I did also want to touch on, uh, kind of bounce off of Kelly, and I could have a conversation with you all day, Kelly. So it says it's great to have this DJ uh, conversation. But essentially, everyone who's in this conversation right now, who's watching this right now, is in a great position to be thinking very long term and masterminding how this does fit into something. So nine to 12 months is a short period of time. What you're asking Fulbright to do is give you money to be an English teacher for the briefest of windows, which means while you're there, you're gonna be thinking, okay, when Fulbright's over, where am I gonna go next? This is why thinking right now, long-term, chess-wise, okay, my move is Fulbright. If I get Fulbright, then I'm gonna start applying for grad schools while I'm in Fulbright, or I'll apply for jobs as an English teacher in this country 
while I am here on Fulbright. I will meet professors at the local university that I wanna do research with while I'm on my Fulbright. So if you plot your course eh, tentatively, but kind of uh, thoughtfully, you will be making Fulbright work for you in more ways than one. Uh, and that's why coming to a session like this right now, which you know, good on you, because you're thinking about how this is going to map out in the future. I have one more thing to, to quickly add, and i um, sorry for talking so much, but just thinking about like the networking that comes from the Fulbright experience, um, just with like the other people who are taking part in the program with you, like your fellow ETAs. Um, I found that, you know, my fellow ETAs, it's a really impressive group of people. I, honestly, I feel like they're much more impressive than I am. And they've ended up doing um, some really amazing things in the future. Um, of course, there are a couple of teachers, you know, folks that ended up being teachers in the future, but um, a lot of people doing like tech founders, uh, some, some lawyers, a lot of really interesting things. So um, I think that's a big benefit of the program too, is now I have these folks that are doing all sorts of interesting things um, in my social network. Um, so I could, you know, draw upon their, their skills and networks in the future if I need to. I hear, hear. What hear. other questions do y'all have? Yeah. Um, so um, something that I was just curious about um, is if it's beneficial to potentially have a TESOL certification already, so a certification in teaching English to, you know, speakers of other languages, if that's something that is seen favorably or if they don't really care, just, yeah, I'm curious about that. This is where that country profile, the place that you're looking at is really going to be key. And they can kind of, sometimes they'll be very blatant, like, hey, we're looking for someone who can actually teach English. Like th This person is gonna play a larger role of ju than just assistant. We want them to be helping with grammar because we want our students to be high achievers on you know English exams, things like that. Sometimes people are more subtle. Sometimes they'll give kind of hints in the background of their conversation. We're looking for someone who's in, incredibly competent and truly loves literature. And that, so they'll hint at it. The best thing to do is really comb through your country profile and see what they're looking for. They may even be giving an indication sometimes in their profile of like, look, you're an assistant. You're an assistant, you are not a teacher. Specifically speaking to people about like, you know, your role. Whereas other places will be telling you, no, we need your help. And that's where I would encourage you to kind of take that opportunity to look through the profile, but effectively to directly answer your question. No, that doesn't exclude you at all. It actually makes you a very valuable candidate depending on where you're applying to. Okay, great. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm going to pop a link into the chat where you can actually click on like the regions and the countries to see the profiles that Melissa is referring Thank to. You, Kelly. One second, I just. Yeah, I realize that that's not up there, is there? Might I ask another question while Kelly? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, um, so I was wondering specifically like English teaching related, what might be some like um, good experiences to highlight on your application or um, uh, what specific experiences might you wanna showcase a little bit more? Um, to really show that you have some um, ability in teaching English um, and that you are a good fit for the role. Well, I, I do want to make sure I know that Kelly was ultimately successful in her application. So it's, I, I will give her the floor to speak a lot about it, especially what was successful about her application. But it, it behooves you to remember, this is where I said that kind of mind ninja thing about diplomacy. This is where you're remembering your number one job is basically being Mickey Mouse. Hi, I'm Naya, I'm a US citizen. It's nice to meet you. The language I'm speaking is English. I went to, I, I'm gonna just use Michigan. I'm from Michigan. This is what Michigan is known for. I'm one piece of the giant quilt that is the United States. And I wanna share that with you. Um, a lot of what Fulbright is looking for is someone with a tad of grit and who doesn't necessarily need to be an extrovert, 
but won't be sitting in their apartment all day. So they want you to be getting out and mingling and showcasing, my gosh, the United States of America, what a place. Um, that's kind of what they're looking for. Now I'll be quiet and I'll let Kelly talk, because I could talk. No, I, I was going to say that too. I think that um, evidence of community engagement, like in your own own community in the United States, I think is is huge. Um, as far as like uh, what sort of experiences related to teaching do you need to have? Um, I, I that would depend on the country. I think that that you're applying for, um, but I guess if the country you're applying for doesn't necessarily have like specific requirements laid out, and if they're open to folks who don't have you know teaching degrees and stuff, I would just say experiences like maybe tutoring experiences, um, experiences working with youth in some way. Um, it could be uh, like volunteer experiences that you've had around Ann Arbor um, in the schools, America Reads. Um, it could be a, a wide range of things. Of course, um, there are, you know, opportunities to teach English in the Ann Arbor Metro Detroit area too. Uh, so if, if you're able to do that on, on a volunteer basis or as part of a class or something, like that's really great, great and relevant. Um, but, but all those sorts of things could be great preparation. I do want to give a shout out to um, the English Language Institute, uh, which has uh, some really amazing resources for folks that are interested in, in teaching English internationally and then also um, teaching English here in, in, in this country too. Um, two amazing classes. Uh, well, when I'm done speaking, I'll pop that link in, in the chat as well, but that's a way to really get some concrete experience, theoretical experience, as well as some um, in really concrete experience um, through the class, and it would be great preparation for a Fulbright. I was going to say also, is, um, ELI is the one that does the English language circles, am I right? The, the Yes, the conversation circles. Conversation mm -hmm. circles. That's, I mean, like, that's a slam dunk. The, the conversation circles are always looking for volunteers to come and talk to international students who are working to improve their English. And that's just, it's just, it couldn't be easier. Go volunteer, help be a part of those circles, throw it on your resume, talk about it in the application. Hey, I talk with international people all the time and I help them with English. We have a wonderful time. And send. It's like, it, it couldn't be uh easier to to be able to help be a part of that program and you'll be helping a lot of people on campus great i i threw the the link in the chat so so take a look um i've heard just such amazing things about the courses offered through the eli um for for teaching english uh students love these courses so definitely take advantage if you're able to fit it into your schedule What I other think, question? Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, I said we were both on the exact same page. Um, uh, if anybody has any more questions, by all means, uh, while you are sitting there and thinking about if you have any more questions about specifically being an English teacher uh, assistant, I did want to mention if you have the opportunity in the future to go and look at the Fulbright website in its entirety, there are things not just for being an English teacher, but also for potentially doing research, for doing master's programs. Um, and again, this is just the beginning of many federal fellowships and scholarships that give you money to effectively go to another country. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, mention, Kelly is uh, the head of the, um, uh, the Peace Corps, another spectacular uh, program that's uh, for getting abroad. So if you're here for English teaching, I totally get it. That's the whole purpose of this. But if there's a part of you that's just like, look, could I just get out into another country at some point? Um, these are places that you will want to know about now. So as you think about the, your future educational career, you can think about where you would put them. Um, because heaven forbid you're halfway through a master's program, you find out a really, about a really great opportunity, but it's passed you by because you don't have any time for it. Um, it's worth checking this stuff out if this has been of any interest to you. I might just pop in with one additional note regarding finances. So when I was an undergrad, um, it was really important for me to try to find a program that was going to be really affordable. 
um, because uh, I, you know, I, I wasn't, I couldn't afford to do, you know, an expensive program that I was paying all sorts of fees for. Um, and so the Fulbright really fit the bill for me. You know, there, there's no application fee. Um, as Melissa talked about, you receive a monthly stipend. And for me in Germany, it was enough for me to live, you know, a student lifestyle. And um, I didn't need to have, you know, a whole lot of money in my own bank account from home in order to survive. Of course, I needed some because, you know, you, you don't normally get paid, you know, the second you get there. I think I had to wait like a, a month or so in order to get my first paycheck. Um, but I, so I had enough money for startup expenses, but then um, I was able to live for the year uh, without um, financial stress, um, which was good. Of course, it, it depends on your lifestyle of, um, and, and the, the type of apartment that you're hoping to get and everything and how much that costs, but it is doable. Um, and then I, I mentioned in the, the chat earlier that if you have loans, um, federal loans, it is possible to defer federal loans um, if you're participating in, you know, a federal program like the Fulbright. So um, I was able to defer my loans without penalty, um, which again, really made the experience much more possible for me as someone who didn't have a lot of financial resources. So if any of you are in that boat and are kind of wondering um, if this is affordable, I just wanted to say that it, it of course, it depends on your personal situation, but it, it could be. And then I would think, say last but not least, because I know we're wrapping up, um, your first inclination may be to think of a country that you know of already, a country that is close to your heart, a country that is potentially, not, not trying to say anything about you, but potentially Western Europe. And before you go and start solidifying an application to a place that it feels comfortable, I would strongly encourage you take a look at some places that might be slightly off the beaten path. Um, I know of people who have lived in Morocco, in Fiji, in uh, Panama, uh, places that you wouldn't necessarily think of um, first, that you might be thinking more of like a Spain or a Denmark or a, you know, a Norway. And I would just encourage, before you write those places off, go take a look at them. They are incredible learning experiences. And if you are particularly interested in political science uh, or in development or in environmental sciences um, or in agriculture or God knows what else, it's really cool to think about, hey, what, what would it be like if I was an English teacher in Mongolia? Um, these, are, these are places where they could use that type of support from the US and do some English teaching. And it is off the beaten path and it would add to your life exponentially. So I just want to put a little plug out there, do some good exploring before you settle on a country. Unless you're like, you know, I definitely know I want to be in France and that my whole life has been France has been building up to this. Okay, fine, go to France, it's fine. No, I'm not heartbroken, it's cool. Anyway, so All I right, think- well, with thank you. Oh, oh, sorry, Melissa. <laughs> I was just gonna thank you for your time. <laughs> Thank you for your time, Melissa, um, for joining us and uh, giving a, a Fulbright info information session um, a little early. As you mentioned, you're, you won't be starting until January officially. So I feel uh, special that you were able to carve out some time to talk to us um, about it in advance of Kelly, that, so. It is always a privilege and a pleasure to come and speak with you. Thank you so much for being so on top of it at all times. Um, and thank you for letting me be a part of it. Great. Thanks everyone thank for joining us. Both, Chris, uh, thank you both for your time. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Have a great weekend, everyone. Take care. You too. Okay, Kelly. I'm going to stop sharing. Move on.